Uh, so those of you who just joined us, I'm Christy Bodie, and I'm a documentary film producer, director, writer. Uh, I run a small production company called Moxie Cran Media. If you want to know the story of how that name came to be, uh, let's chat more later. <laughs> Uh, and I'm based out of Southern Colorado, and really a lot of my work has been focused around natural resources, water, land, um, and really the human and ecological communities. So as you can imagine, the, the topics are far and wide, and there's no shortage of content and, and people and organizations really to, needing to get their story out there. So I work with a spectrum of nonprofits, state, federal agencies, um, quasi-governmental groups like IWJV, um, universities, et cetera. And I've been really fortunate or I've been able to glean a lot of knowledge and insight from those that I work with and the people that I meet out in the field and really try and package videos that take the technical, maybe take the science and really trying to make it into a human interest story where you're blending what I call the head and the heart. Um, I will plug my portfolio in the chat box. You can kind of take a look at the spectrum of work that I've done, but really um, to kind of get more into the heart of our conversation is what this process is like in, a video producer, production company, videographer, you know, I call myself a place-based storyteller because uh, I really am seeing more and more the impact of telling locally based stories um, and really starting as a, commun uh, a community conversation starter. So uh, Emily and Nicole kindly of all of the questions they put in front of me because I'm going to throw a lot of information at you just speaking from my experience but really kind of went with the top three questions and we can take the conversation from there. But um, the first one being is how do you find a videographer whose style aligns with your vision? And I think the vision question is the big thing is figuring out what story do you want to tell? Um, and I'll tell you, I've run the spectrum of clients and people in approaching me of like, we want to tell a story about water and farms <laughs> to a very specific uh, need and goal in mind. So I think oops, um, that it doesn't have to look any specific way, but I think maybe the more focused in that you can be on your idea, um, what you want to communicate is definitely helpful. Um, but you know, kind of taking the example of my work with IWJV, um, and I know that there's there's a couple video links. I don't know if they've been shared out yet that I've done with them as it relates to their Water for campaign um, work that they've been doing. But is, and I think a lot, you know, a lot of these conservation-based stories take place in rural areas and. I'll say being in a rural area and having more of that immersive experience definitely gives a storyteller or videographer a leg up um, on kind of what the community's like uh, mm -hmm. and how to navigate those topics. So I think a first question to think about is that locality. You know, I know in some of these rural areas, there's not always an option of having a, a local videographer or production company. Um, of course, a lot of us are, are more urban-based focused. I personally here in Southwest Colorado, or I'm kind of equally inconvenienced for everyone, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, but thinking about what is this company or individual's familiarity with the topic? Are they, you know, if it's something about migratory birds, maybe it has to do with the agricultural community. Um, I think you want to connect and find someone, and this is an always option that maybe just already has some familiarity with the landscape and the topic. You know, there are definitely others in the field that are working within the conservation realm. Um, you know, it, you will find, I think, along the process that you don't have to start at zero um, with some of someone if they already have that topic knowledge. 
Um, looking at their recent work, or if you can't locate it, uh, requesting to, to see it. I know personally, uh, I'm not directing people to my website right now because not all of my most recent work lives on there. Um, I'll also plug that link in the chat as well. But um, sometimes the work that you see online doesn't always reflect what's actually a part of their portfolio. Um, something to keep in mind. And, you know, really the, the leading questions that I start with, and I think a lot of others, is not only like what's your vision, but who's your audience? Do you have any idea of who that audience is? Um, and then what's your budget? I know because I do work with a lot of NGOs, a lot of the funding sources come through grants or restricted funds, whether that's federal or state money. Um, it gets be, I, I know I appreciate when organizations are really transparent about what they have available or vice versa. I think being straightforward too with the organization, okay, this is your vision. This is what it will take, you know, an estimate of what it would take to accomplish that. You know, are those locations, you know, that are part of the story, geographic distance, that's a consideration. <laughs> Um, you know, time of year, seasonality, how that's another consideration. Um, you know, are you wanting to tell a story about a specific project or collaboration that took place? For example, a piece that I worked on with IWJB centered around the data being collected around Sandhill cranes and migratory information. Um, it, that was definitely seasonally dependent on being out with the scientists and the biologists when they were physically collecting the data. Just thinking about those little elements that are really impactful part of telling the story. Um, you know, sometimes appro I'm approached about, hey, we want to do a story about snow science and we're like just after the snowpack season and in runoff. So thinking that to visually speaking when things are happening um, is something to be thinking about. Um, and alongside and working in rural communities, um, I think, you know, the individual or company being comfortable working in that setting, but also their adaptability to working outdoors Mother Nature will throw a lot at us, um, it kind of the, your ability to adapt and go with the flow of things I have found and learned over time. It is that fine mixture of having a structure and keeping people moving ahead and forward, and, and especially when you've got a list of locations or people that you need to talk to, but also just knowing you know, maybe a farmer's got to go move some water and you've got to adjust your schedule. Um, it's just always nice to find someone, um, be working with a group of people that just have that mutual understanding and flexibility. Uh, and also when kind of thinking about who to work with is what other services or experience do they bring to the table? You know, there's others like myself that will see the product from beginning to end, you know, pre-production process to kind of scripting, storyboarding that story to the field production, to the editing process. Um, you know, are we going to be working with a, a third party consultant or marketing person? You know, I've worked with organizations that have also hired someone that's thinking more of that PR campaign. Um, that much bigger picture, um, working with small organizations where maybe um, in Emily's case, where you're thinking about <laughs> not only the messaging, but your distri distribution outlets and kind of wearing a couple different hats. So thinking, you know, what those other services that who you're working with can bring to the table. Uh, another big question that I get asked is, how do you select the right people um, to help tell your story, put in front of the camera? So I'm going to focus more on interview based. You know, I think there's definitely different approaches and I don't have a one size fits all approach uh, on the story. I think it's a mixture of what the client is wanting to need, um, communicate, 
who, what audience are we talking to? What language are they speaking in physically and figuratively? Uh, and where is it going to be shown? But I'm, I find more times than not, especially in conservation-based work, since a lot of it is collaborative in nature, there's a lot of moving parts. There's so much intersectionality between, you know, it, it's impossible to talk about all these different elements in a silo. So I think of it as dot connecting. Um, and so when you're kind of thinking about those people who you want to put in front of the camera, I say that choosing the expert in the room is not necessarily always the best decision. I think, you know, if you're telling a story and then an example of some of the IWJV work I've done where you're trying to blend that science and land-based knowledge, um, I think there is space for both of those forms of knowledge to live in and you really want to honor, but you've got to kind of decide what you're centering. Um, as I find that to try and be everything to everyone, it, it kind of thinking of an audience as of one, speaking to a room of one. So in thinking about who you select, um, you know, sometimes the expert just is not the most suitable person to convey in that message. Um, you know, finding someone who's relatable, who is a good storyteller can tell you 95% of people in this world are not trained to be uber comfortable in front of the camera. So I think too, in working with uh, working with a video production company, you also want to think about interview tactics and whether that's yourself or someone from the organization that will be conducting the interview that has that comfortable familiarity or maybe has a relationship with who you're interviewing. I think about those things as too. Maybe I'm not the most suitable one to be doing the interview. Um, you know, and working with production houses that have have experience in pre-field and post-production realms, maybe they are the person more most suitable um, to helping conduct that interview. I think you want to think about um, kind of making that individual or person comfortable because sometimes these aren't topics that are easy to think about um, and thinking about a narrative that really blends the head with the heart. Um, let's see here, you know, and just when I kind of deciding that to in building credibility with your audience, for example, if you're creating a video that's more targeted towards the agricultural community, that message may is going to be received probably a lot better coming from someone who is walking the walk. Um, maybe it's a video that's targeted towards uh, a real popular <laughs> uh, request I've been getting in the past years. We want a video to educate legislators. <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know if there's enough um, book time or, or time or budget <laughs> on how to kind of bite that off. You want to think of geography, you know, are they an urban, rural based? And sometimes you've got that mixture of both. So kind of keeping those things in mind um, of how to build credibility with your audience. Um, another big question that I ask when thinking about people to put in front of the camera, how often has this person been featured in other stories? I find a uh, particularly within the agricultural realm, uh, because, and I will say this, it's not necessarily industry specific. A lot of people do shy away from the camera, <laughs> engineers, scientists, researchers, what have you. But I, I like to think, okay, if we're gravitating towards the same five people, this individual has been featured in a lot of different work. Can we dig a bit deeper? Can we find someone else that would be can help carry that message or communicate the story? And if the answer is yes, I think it's always worth building some time and an investment to fostering a relationship with them. You know, if you don't ask, the question's always no. So thinking of what voices haven't been amplified that have been often overlooked and really approaching that person in a very authentic way. Um, people know when they're being tokenized. This is something that I am 
continuously navigating in my work. I think as we've seen more diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives come to the surface, both at organizational levels, state, federal agencies. And I don't feel like I have always done it perfectly. And I feel like a lot of the people that I work with are still figuring out what that looks like as well. So again, kind of centering the voices of, of those you're wanting to talk to. And also acknowledging that maybe I'm not the best person, you know, or video production company to help tell that story. You know, if you're really, for example, wanting to tell a story that's based around water security um, on, on tribal lands or within a Pueblo or a tribal nation, is there is there someone already there within that community that is creating videos? Um, really, again, that knows how to speak the language of the community that you're trying to reach. Um, moving on to let's see the, the third question is how do you make your video go further? Tips and tricks for video promotion and sharing. I think. And I'm always encouraging everyone that I work with is to be thinking about distribution and where you're going to be showing your video from day one. It's really hard to reverse engineer when we're thinking about that, like the final stage or like when I'm delivering a completed video, I'm like, okay, good luck. <laughs> um, you know, put it out on Facebook and, and just see where it goes. But, um, the media space is ever changing and evolving. I'm finding I'm constantly needing to refresh myself on what is effective and really lead my clients in the right direction. So, you know, some things to be thinking about your video distribution strategy kind of coming out of the gate is, of course, the online potential and distribution of it. That's embedding videos on your website. That's having a layout and making the video really easy to find, putting it on your landing page. Don't make whoever's going there have to dig and find it. Um, having a captivating, like, you know, the, the um, still photo that sits on the video before you press the playhead, make that visually interesting. Make them want to click on it. Um, Thinking about um, including a call to action. Um, thinking about social media channels. Again, I feel like this information might be antiquated within a year time, <laughs> but you know, Facebook is still a place where you're going to capture a more diverse audience. Not everyone uses sound. Can't assume everyone is playing the sound when they're going through their social media um, feeds. This applies to Facebook. Twitter, Instagram. Um, so really thinking about subtitles or captions, the ability to make these videos shareable. Um, don't kind of negate the power of a share. If you are working on this, this project involves other partners, like even sending some of your partners a personal e email blast. Hey, we just created this video. Could you please share this through your networks? That will really help you gain traction as well. Um, posting teaser videos to drive people back to your website. People on social media are not going to be inclined to watch a six to eight minute video. Share, you know, what I like to always include when we're thinking about those initial conversations um, and creating a video and a story is. Can create, we create a 60 to 90 second teaser. Using that teaser on social media as a way to drive people back to your website. Maybe that teaser could be included in an e-blast. Um, could it be included with a digital article, but as really a way to capture the curiosity of people who wanna know more, because you can't tell everyone all the things in, in a six to eight minute video. And I say six to eight minute video because I have found repeatedly that seems to be the sweet spot for a lot of these conservation based videos I've been doing to communicate the main messaging points, but leave breadcrumbs of curiosity for your audience to want to learn and find out more. Um, legislators, you're lucky if you get six to eight minutes, 
So really, if you think about extending beyond that time frame, um, it, it can be tough to hold attention spans. So we've talked about Facebook, um, again, Instagram, again, can't assume that people are playing with the sound on. Um, and this goes back to thinking about who your target audience is. You got to kind of go paint out where they're hanging out. Um, I won't get into all of the legalities of what's going on with TikTok right now. I'm sure you could Google, Google that and find quickly what's going out in that space. But thinking about the age demographic there, you know, if you're wanting to reach younger generations, you know, hiring hiring someone within that space, um, I'm, I hesitate to use the word influencer, but I'm kind of an old fogey, so maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, take my language verbatim, but you know, if you're looking again, who you're trying to talk to and reach, maybe leaning on someone younger to help you create videos for TikTok. If you're really trying to engage um, or promote an event or whatever it may be, if it's a more diverse, older audience, um, thinking about that as well, including text and graphics. If you're not going to be using sound. Um, but those are really important, important things to think about as well and can be really big forms of visual communication and can help pull people in. Um, YouTube it would, it is really a no brainer. Um, you know, I encourage every organization, if you haven't already, to start your own YouTube channel. Um, and that is a great place where you can generate closed captioning. It's a free service. There's a lot of videos out there that can show you how to tailor your captioning because AI generators don't do it perfectly and flawlessly. People can also access transcripts there. Some people just like to read the written words. Um, and then finally, don't dismiss the power of live events and in-person conversations and conferences. You know, this is really a way to stimulate conversation in person. And I find those can be the most valuable, um, even if sometimes in those settings, it can feel a little bit like an echo chamber. I find that it, it can really be a conversation starter. And I think that's really all I can ask for in a lot of the work I do, because it's hard to measure the actual, you know, to measure the effectiveness of a video and the amount of times it's been viewed or the number of likes it's received or it's been shared. Sure, those are metrics that you can look at and take as feedback. And maybe that hinges on the platform you're using or time of day you're posting. And there's a lot of SEO specialists out there the kind of more privy and savvy to that paid content versus, you know, just the power of a share. But I've just found a lot of the most valuable feedback um, I've received is just those in-person conversations um, and sharing the video, whether it's at a film screening, part of a film festival, at a water or land conference, what have you. Um, so I feel like I've been talking at you all for long enough. <laughs> Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or anything I just blazed over or that felt really murky. <laughs> Christy, I have a question to maybe tee off and, and open this up to other people for questions, but um, I know a lot of the work uh, on the video products that we worked on together was in that pre-production area, um, kind of creating a script and a narrative for, for the video story that we were trying to tell. Um, and me as like predominantly a writer, um, I really had to lean on you and your expertise of just video and showing, um, showing kind of a story versus like writing it. And so I was wondering if you had any um, takeaways or tips for making that process uh, easier or just uh, like things to think of for someone like me that's coming to you to ask for a video. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one being just open to the process, uh, we're not going to get it right the first time out of the gate. I see what other um, communication endeavor it might be in taking written words into a video format. One, just getting all of those ideas out on paper. I will ask 
clients just just do an idea dump on a document i don't care if it doesn't isn't organized or if it's not perfectly worded uh, i just want to figure out where your head's at and uh, kind of try and distill what the important messaging points are together um things in a written document is does not as translate fluidly most of the time into a video a lot of it can be show and don't tell um, if I'm going to tell you about a drought or um, water insecurity, I might show a low river. I don't necessarily need to always be putting that into narration or an interview soundbite. Um, maybe it's just talking about the majestic beauty of the flyway. Like, show me a majestic shot of the river and the flyway. Like, make me feel something when I'm looking at that kind of take people there with you we don't need to write a bunch of adjectives and descriptive words and put it in a video like let the video do the telling for you like give your audience some credit that they will be able to piece that together and follow along um yeah I would say too is I, I think and with Emily and I finding, you know, finding someone that you can work with too, where it feels like, you know, I tell people we're going to kick this back and forth a few times and we'll get it to where it needs to be. So, um, you know, someone that you can work collaboratively with, because there certainly are certain objectives and messaging points that various organizations are wanting to hit. You know, maybe it's more of an advocacy piece where there might be a piece of legislation on the table and you're really, you know, on one side or the other, or it's an organization that's really walking the middle line that's re representing a lot of different interests. I think you want, you want whoever the vessel is for telling that story to be able to be responsive to what your end goal is, but also offer suggestions on how to make it better.